welcome them. How's that? Um, good evening and welcome. I'm Bonnie McCarthy, and I'll be your host this evening for a very special and exciting discussion between our two amazing and very special guests who share a passion for history and storytelling, Lawrence Jerdom and Lauren Willig. Lawrence's new book, The Rough Riders and the Professor, released earlier this month, chronicles the extraordinary 35-year friendship between President Theodore Roosevelt and Massachusetts Senator Henry Cabot Lodge. Did I say that right? No. Okay. <laughs> the two unlikely friends developed a personal relationship that shaped American politics and set standards and practices into motion that reverberate today. In order to tell the story, Lawrence referred to more than 2,500 personal letters which were exchanged by the two politicians as they supported and encouraged each other throughout their careers and lives, making it a truly intimate look at their thoughts, feelings, and motivations. Author T.J. Stiles, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Custer's Trials and the First Tycoon, had this to say about the new book. Quote, few political friendships have been as consequential as that of Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge. The two wrote or spoke to each other almost every day for decades, exchanging ideas, reading each other's books, and promoting shared policies. By focusing on this pair, Lawrence Jordan shrewdly illuminates not only a fascinating personal relationship, but the making of modern politics and government at the dawn of the American century. Lawrence lives nearby in Fairfield County, and I think I heard you talking earlier. You've already gotten to know him on that. Um, and he is an adjunct professor of history at Fairfield University and Fordham College. He is also the author of Paving, Paving the Way for Reagan, the Influence of Conservative Media on U.S. Foreign Policy. And as a frequent writer on American politics, you can look for his byline from news outlets such as the New York Times, Washington Post, and San Francisco Chronicle. He is joined in conversation this evening by New York Times bestselling author, Lauren Willig. Lauren is an award-winning award author of historical fiction with titles that include the Pink Carnation series, The Band of Sisters, The Summer Country, The English Wife, and the one that we have today, Two Wars and the Wedding. Um, her work has been translated into more than 20 languages and she was chosen for the American Library Association's annual list of the best genre of fiction. Lauren is a New York City native, mother of two, and alumna of both Harvard and Yale. Overachieving from an early age, Lauren read her first romance novel at age six and, her, and submitted her first 300 page handwritten manuscript to a publishing house at age nine. The rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> Please help me welcome authors Lauren Sturdum and Lauren Willock. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and thank you for having us here tonight. I am so thrilled to be sitting here with Larry, although this is a far cry from the old days where we used to sit there over drinks discussing your dissertation research. <laughs> so I was thrilled when I discovered that Lawrence was working on a book about Theodore Roosevelt at the same time that I was working on a book that contained cameo appearances by Teddy Roosevelt. But I was very curious because again, in those old days over drinks when we would discuss your research, it was all the late, mid to late 20th century. And so I wanted to know what made you decide to hop back that hundred years to the rise of Theodore Roosevelt? Well, first of all, Lauren, it's so <laughs> great to be here with you. You know, Lauren has been a friend of mine for many years. We were trying to count how many, I think um, maybe somewhere around 15. 15 years. Mm -hmm. I am, I'm so, pleased and happy and proud of your incredible success you've had. And it's wonderful for you to be here. And thank you, Bonnie, for the wonderful introduction. And it's so great to be here with all of you and to hear R.J. Julian's wonderful book story. Um, this book came out of um, what somebody I think referred to and possibly rightly as a COVID book. Um, when uh, in 2020, when we were all locked down, I was teaching remotely and I was 
thinking I always wanted to write a commercial book. The last book I wrote, Paving Way for Reagan, uh, was an academic book. It was a dissertation based on my dissertation. And I'd always wanted to write a really compelling nonfiction book. And I thought to myself, and I, as a, ever since I was a little boy, I loved presidents. I had this like huge presidential pencil sharpener. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have that ruler that had all the, the presidents? I think I had, that, I had that one too. And I just, just mm -hmm. loved all, all of this. And I thought, and I also always loved writing about friendship and the camaraderie among men. And I thought, you know, what great friendship could I write about that perhaps hasn't been written about? And I thought, well, obviously, Jefferson and Adams and um, all these different things. And I thought, well, who was Theodore Roosevelt's closest friend? I haven't really been able to, looking at different things. And, and I thought, well, Henry Cabot Lodge. And I'm like, has a book been written on it? Well, no. And I thought, why not? Because in all the um, books you read, particularly in Edmund Moritz's books, mm -hmm. The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt, you know, Lodge is always a figure, kind of a shadowy figure. You don't see or learn that much about him. Right, there's a little bit of the Cardinal Richelieu about him there, lurking in the shadows. Exactly. And I thought, well, what if I wrote a book about this incredible friendship? And I found an old book, which I had discovered in a footnote in Edmund Morris's book, Rise of TR, called The President Makers. And I've forgotten the name of the gentleman who wrote it. It was written in the 40s. And it argued that Theodore Roosevelt was dramatically influenced and helped by Henry Cabot Lodge to make it to the White House. And I thought, well, what a wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, why don't I start looking at that? And I then uh, wrote a proposal, which Lauren probably knows, having you know, submitted novels to agents and, mm -hmm. and all that. And I submitted this proposal at the height of COVID and uh, eventually it was accepted. But by that point, COVID had really taken hold. And I thought to myself, okay, so you're giving me two years to write this, or even like 16 months to write this thing. That's not long for a scholarly project. And I was like, okay, well, how am I going to get to the, uh, the research? Because everything is shut down. And I discovered there was this collection at the Boston Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston that there were 2,500 letters uh, between the two of them. I found this old volume, two volume collection of the published correspondence between Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge. And I thought, well, is this everything? Well, it wasn't everything. It was a lot more. And I was fortunate through the wonders of interlibrary loan, the wonderful folks at my library in Darien, which was still open, uh, arranged to have the microfilm copy edition of the letters between TR and Lodge sent down to Darianne from Boston. Oh my goodness. And I was able to then get into the library. They actually had a microfilm machine, which though periodically breaking down, <laughs> always seemed to work thanks to all the really great people there. And I just spent my time going through these incredible letters. And these letters, um, I hope when those of you who read the book these letters were these two men essentially saying anything that came to their mind at any time because nobody else was going to read these letters and they could say exactly what they wanted and did. And TR referred to Benjamin Harrison, President Benjamin Harrison at the time as a short little toad <laughs> and a boo and uh, made other references calling Woodrow Wilson later on in their correspondence, the worst president in history, a horrible man, uh, uh, just, just constantly letting things fly. And so it was a wonderfully great and rich opportunity for me to write, as, as Lorden said earlier, a personality-driven book, but at the same time, connecting issues that are really affecting our society today in the same way it affected TR and lodge, things like tariffs, immigration, uh, the extent and, and influence of, of the federal government, uh, the issue of isolationism versus internationalism. So all of this was there, and I thought it would be a very relevant uh, idea. And fortunately, um, it came to fruition, and I'm, I'm really happy that it did. I mean, how incredible that that trove of letters was there. Um, had other historians mined these before? Had anyone gone into them in any real way? 
Yes, um, they have. I mean, Edmund Morris mm -hmm. had uh, done it. Uh, Kathleen Dalton mm -hmm. uh, is a woman who's at Harvard now. Uh, had written a book uh, called *The Strenuous Life*, a book about TR, and had, you know, mined these letters. Uh, others as well, but I don't think anybody has used them as much as I did. I don't think there are as many of the letters cited in their books as in mine, because my book is really about that friendship, and that friendship is based on that correspondence. So I tried to interweave a narrative while using as many of these letters as I as I could. Well, one of the things I adored about this book is that it is a snapshot of the 19th century because you follow both men literally from cradle to grave. And you see this world, their interwoven worlds, a world of Oyster Bay and Boston and Tucker Nuck unfolding with all the major events of the late 19th century around them. But what really interests me, and I had not realized until tonight, was that you went into this with not with Roosevelt as the object and Lodge as a byproduct, but really focusing from the start on the friendship. What made you decide to look at presidential friendships? Well, I love um, I love uh, reading about friendships mm -hmm. and films about friendship, and um, it, it's just there's something about friendship and and the power of it the joy of it. Mm -hmm. In this case, we see the heartbreak of it too. Um, but that camaraderie among men is something that I've always found really interesting. And both these guys were so unbelievably dynamic. I came to really adore them. I confess I adored Lodge a bit more than TR. I just thought really? Lodge was great. That does not come across in the book at all. I'm sorry, I don't want to give spoilers. Yeah, just, you can read it and come to your own conclusions, but I did not get that impression. Were you trying to do no, just push back against your own inclinations? Or no, it's just you know I love the scheming. I love all the machinations. <laughs> you know we love our you know it's like it's sort of the super villain thing. You know the guys like. And Lodge was always thinking about trying to figure out ways 10, 12 steps ahead of everybody else, trying to figure out how can I prevent this crisis from happening? Well, how can I get the party? One of my favorite anecdotes in your book is of one of the Roosevelt children being asked by the papers what to do about something. And he says, and I'm misquoting, you'll have to correct me, go speak to Senator Lodge. That's what my father says exactly. whenever he wants something done. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that actually came to be a problem because when Roosevelt went into office, he and Lodge were so close. He was asked by a journalist, well, you know, Mr. President, we're all wondering how are you going to negotiate this relationship you have with Senator Lodge? Because people know you are so close. It seems that as if, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here, that he has sort of a carte blanche to the White House. Mm -hmm. And Roosevelt looked at this journalist and said, no, 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 you don't understand. Lodge doesn't run me, I run him. And, you know, that quote to me is very telling because there was always this kind of reputation or image that was going around Washington at the time that Roosevelt was making his way up the, the political ladder that uh, it was the firm of Lodge and Roosevelt. You know, Lodge was the senior man, Roosevelt was the junior man, Roosevelt was the guy Lodge was helping and and pushing and and this sort of thing and then we have this shift changing of the guard so to speak and the question is well is Cabot going to be as powerful a fixture as he was previously and he certainly tries to be but there's more than one occasion where Roosevelt pushes back and I'll tell one quick anecdote but there was a moment where Lodge wrote Roosevelt a note and asked him to write a proclamation for the 200th anniversary of Brookline, Massachusetts. And Roosevelt gets the letter and literally maybe the next day he writes back and he literally writes, my dear man, please don't ever send me another request like this again. I get requests like this all the time. I don't need to get it from you. And Lodge, who was really taken aback by this and he literally wrote, oh, I was only kidding, sorry, but the man had no sense of humor. So it's difficult to say <laughs> that he was kidding because he never he never kidded about anything. Um, but it, it was just a fascinating relationship, and and this relationship in the White House, Lodge, you know, 
wrote to Roosevelt early on, don't worry, I'm not interested in encroaching on your domain. I'm as, I've gone as far as I can go. I've been a senator from Massachusetts since 1893. I have no interest in anything else. And he probably didn't have any interest in anything else, but he wanted to keep his hand in the game. He loved power and he loved exercising it. And having Theodore Roosevelt in the White House was one way for him to do so. And this became a big, a big issue um, as we moved through the presidency. There was an article that was written in the Boston Globe, I think in 1902 or 1903, a huge article on a Sunday afternoon that had a big cartoon of, of Henry Cabot Lodge next to a huge um, switchboard with all of the key issues that Lodge and he, that Roosevelt was interested in. And it said, Henry Cabot Lodge operator in this huge headline saying, Henry Cabot Lodge, the boss of Washington. So can you imagine what Theodore Roosevelt must have, must have felt like when he saw this? And I have no record, wasn't able to find out what he thought of it, but you know, can't imagine it was a good thing. Well, because he was a man who controlled his image so firmly. I mean, this is the guy who invited the Vitagraph company along to make moving pictures of him during the Spanish-American War. Which I did not know, and that was really interesting to read about, too, in your, in your books. That was a great uh, bit of, of history that I didn't know. It was fascinating because it's, he, he controlled, although he is such an outspoken person, and that comes across so clearly in your book, he is also so conscious of his image. I, I love imagining Theodore Roosevelt in the era of social media. Because can't you just imagine what his Instagram account would look like? <laughs> yeah. but so I was wondering, because he himself so self-mythologized, I mean, I think about that statue of him in front of the Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was so great at, at creating his own image and of course also his own sense of his inevitable rise to prominence. How do you go about untangling those layers of myth and legend, both the ones he created himself and the ones that were later built around him. Was that hard at all to dig under that and try to get to the real man? Well, it's 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 difficult. What I have to do is I've got to rely on on the sources and I've mm -hmm. got to I've got to rely on the documents. And and, you know, he was a guy and I think I even say this in the book, you know, he created these mountains, they say, you know, you built a, a, a mountain out of a molehill and Roosevelt built mountains out of molehills all the time. Um, he always loved to sort of portray himself as this kind of like guy who was fighting against these giants, whoever they happened to be, whether they were the malefactors of great wealth, whether they were the conservative conservatives in Congress, you know, whomever it happened to be. And he would create these dramas. I mean, his life was a living drama, as, as you write about in, in your book. I mean, the whole Rough Rider thing was this marvelous drama. Well, what's said. amazing is that he gets away with it most of the time. And you chronicle very well in your book, the times he doesn't, when he picks these battles and they actually don't work out for him. But what's so incredible I found about him is that he does, it's this... Um, it's like the hero in a Marvel movie. He does these impossible things, but by force of personality, he makes it work. I mean, the Rough Riders should never have worked. Yeah, and, and one of the things I neglect, I did not put in, in the book, mm -hmm. um, but I thought about it, was this Roosevelt waged this major campaign to try to win the Congressional Medal of Honor. And after uh, the Spanish-American mm -hmm. War, or rather, I'm sorry, even during Soon after he, he returned from the battle in Cuba, he really lobbied Lodge hard mm -hmm. to get that uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. The problem was nobody, the stuff he claimed he did, nobody saw him do, <laughs> except for, um, forgive me, the gentleman who was, who we put more or less in charge. Leonard Wood. Leonard Wood. Yeah. But other than him, there was nobody around. And he kept writing Lodge about this, telling him to, get in front of the Secretary of War, mm -hmm. explain to him what I did and this. And finally, Lodge was like, you know, <laughs> you got to calm down because this just isn't going to happen. And obviously it wasn't until Bill Clinton gave him this award posthumously uh, that he finally got the, the, the Congressional Medal. That was a fascinating corollary. Yeah, it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, yeah, when Theodore Roosevelt wanted something, he really mm -hmm. went after it and it didn't, 
matter, you know, how aggressive he was, it was determined to I mean, that sense of expedience really comes out that, I mean, he's in, at the same time, an incredibly principled man and also an incredibly unprincipled one. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, because it's, it was so fascinating reading your long view of his life, because when I was writing Two Wars and a Wedding, it's like one of those maps where you have the little circle where you then blow it up large, because I was looking very closely at about two months of his life as opposed to the long stretch. But it was fascinating to me how you can see in microcosm in the Spanish-American War, the traits you describe across the stretch of his life, you know, his ability to do whatever it takes to achieve his goal at the moment. Yeah, no, I mean, he didn't, he, as far, and you think about this man died when he was 60 years old. I mean, think about this physicality mm -hmm. that he, uh, I was. I, there's a, I have a photograph of him in the latter part of, of 1918. He's holding one of his granddaughters, and he looks like a man of 75. And he was 60 years old, but his body was so battered between the polo and the fox hunting and the and the the war and the river of doubt and the food and the coffee and the four <laughs> eggs every day and all of that. It's just like you know, why aren't we surprised about? about how, how how short but full his life happened to happen to be. Well, and you have a picture in the book that I love because it's of young Teddy Roosevelt and you don't recognize him because we all have this image of Teddy Roosevelt with that little bushy mustache as he is later in life, frozen in time. And he looks like that for most of his life. But you look at him before that and you're like, who is this guy? Yeah. Yeah. And 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 they both in their own way um aged a great deal. I mean, Lodge was a physically a very a very good looking man. If you look at pictures of any of his children, if you look at Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., you know, they were very sculpted, you know, tremendous cheekbones. And over time you see Lodge aging this incredible, you know, mat of, of black hair, you know, turns white, and you see that his eyes getting more and more wrinkled. And this was a guy who 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 lived very hard, uh, not so much from a physical point of view, but he loved tennis. They were both very competitive men who rode a great deal, who played tennis together, fox hunting. Roosevelt learned fox hunting from Lodge. And Roosevelt's attitude is the faster you can go, the more dangerous the event, the better it is. And I have this quote in the book, something to the effect of, I always like to, uh, I always like to pay the piper after I have a good dance or something like that. After he took this major accident during a uh, fox hunting event where he broke his arm, he scraped up his face, he did all of these things, couldn't care less. Mm -hmm. And he wrote Lodge about it because he was very proud of how, uh, <laughs> of how well he did this. He's a Timex before there was a Timex. He takes a licking and he keeps oh, yeah, it. Exactly. The, well, the, the 19th century Energizer Bunny. I think he was blind from the, in one eye from the time he was in college as a boxing event. Yeah, I feel like that might have been later on. I don't, I, I can't, I'm not going to sort of doubt you, but that's 100% right. And, and who does that, right? I mean, who, who, who allows you to self take a pounding? Well, it's like, I can take it. Well, so, I mean, this so is, you know, he, he, he rides right at the Spanish line in San Juan Hill because he's Teddy Roosevelt and he can do that. And only he and the heroes of Lord of the Rings can do that sort of thing <laughs> without dying on the spot. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you think about this, you know, and, and I also read the, the, the two men's fathers had a great deal of influence on him. And, and I think we, those of you who read about Theodore Roosevelt know his father always said, get action. Man was not meant to be an oyster. Roosevelt's whole philosophy, that strenuous life, reach outside your comfort zone, do things that are not natural, take risks, seize opportunities, try new things. And he did all of these things. And I suspect, I think Lodge did the same thing. I mean, neither man uh, was meant to be a politician. I remember politics was looked down upon by men of their class and stature. And Henry Cabot Lodge, was uh, was no orator. Uh, he was a tremendous intellect, but he was no orator. And the quote by many, like one man said that his voice reminded him of the tearing of a bedsheet. <laughs> and literally, if you go online, you can listen to Henry Cabot Lodge give a speech about the League of Nations. And Lodge even said 
his voice reminded himself of a dentist drill. <laughs> and it does sound like that. It's like, ah, you know, like that. And, and, and Roosevelt had this high pitched, squeaky voice. Uh, I mean, neither one of them, you know, were spellbounding uh, mm -hmm. uh, orders in, the, in their own way, certainly in terms of, of today. Um, and, and Lodge was not a natural politician. He didn't like people. He didn't like, he didn't like campaigning with regular people. He turned, he didn't, he was, he went to Buffalo with Theodore Roosevelt to the same uh, World's Fair uh, where, uh, where uh, William McKinley was assassinated months earlier. Roosevelt and Lodge went there. Lodge didn't want to go precisely because he didn't want to mix with all the immigrants and, and uh, all of the regular oh, folks who were there. Mm -hmm. But Roosevelt convinced him and they went and they had an interesting time. But, you know, Lodge just didn't uh, just didn't like people very, very much. Um, <laughs> you know, he was comfortable with his beautiful wife. He enjoy he was comfortable with people like Henry Adams or Theodore Roosevelt or people of his own class or Cecil Spring Rice, people who who he could relate to and he could actually be relaxed and warm with them. But among uh, people, it just wasn't someone you really wanted to have around. So do you think that's what drew them together? That that difference that you've got Lodge, who's the thoughtful operator, and Roosevelt, who never met a group of people he didn't want to talk to. Yes, I think, you know, to, to pull a phrase from, the, mm -hmm. from Franklin Roosevelt, I really do believe that, that uh, Lodge believed TR had a rendezvous with destiny. There was something about Theodore Roosevelt when Henry Cabot Lodge sat down with him on a train in 1884, going down to Washington to see if they could topple James Blaine from the top of the Republican pyramid. And there was something about Roosevelt, this ebullient spirit, incredibly well-read well -read man, uh, this great ambition, this incredible drive, this incredible spirit, both Harvard men, both Porcillian men, both historians, both good writers, both sportsmen, two men who enjoyed living well, each dressed beautifully. Um, so there was a lot that drew them together and a similar political vision mm -hmm. to change, uh, to make America, or rather make the United States a force to reckon with in the world. So I have to ask, going into this, into this vast correspondence between them, were there any major surprises as you were researching? Well, it's interesting because there was a book that was written about a biography of Lodge by a very good historian named John Garrity, who was a professor at Columbia for a long time. And he wrote a, this book in the 50s. And at the time he wrote it, nobody had written a biography of Henry Cabot Lodge because the papers were in control of Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., who was the senator from Massachusetts. And he and his grandfather were very, very close. And the curator of the papers who I was talking to was telling me when Garrity was writing it, Lodge Jr. basically was looking over his shoulder the whole time. And the thing, when I was reading Garrity's book, he said, oh, you know, in terms of things like the square deal and other things, yeah, there was a little bit of tension there, but not really. Well, there was a lot of tension there. <laughs> there was one letter which Garrity actually didn't use or use for whatever reason, um, where Lodge was having dinner with a judge whose last name was Fessenden uh, in one of the uh, hamlets in Massachusetts. And Fessenden, Judge Fessenden was a very big Republican and a conservative Republican. And he was talking to Lodge about how upset he was with Roosevelt and Roosevelt's growing progressivism in regards to the square deal. And he's pheasant and told Lodge, you better have uh, the president kind of calm down a little bit because he's alienating a lot of Republicans, especially big money men who donate to the party and, and really can, can make or break a Republican party, depending on how they're feeling financially um, anytime. And Roosevelt wrote, rather Lodge wrote Roosevelt about this and said exactly that. And Roosevelt said, you know, well, I'll, I'll try to, it down. Of course, he, he didn't, but you know. <laughs> but yeah, there was a lot of tension there because Lodge spent his time playing uh, the ambassador to the conservative wing of the Republican Party, going and talking to all of the financial types, many men who he knew very, very well in Boston, on State Street, New York, on Wall Street. And Lodge was down there all the time saying, don't worry, he might say you know how they, you know how they would, uh, the phrase about President Trump, you know, 
don't pay any attention to what he says, watch <laughs> what he does. And that was sort of the, don't pay any attention to what uh, what uh, President Roosevelt says, just, just watch what he does, you don't have anything to worry about. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, that wasn't true either. Mm-hmm. And and it just, it, I think it drove Lodge to distraction. I think it really, it, it really bothered him. But, you know, as long as the Republicans remained in power, as long as there was a Republican in the White House, as long as the Republicans had a majority in Congress, it didn't matter. Well, and then, of course, Roosevelt goes and pulls his bull moose stunt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, um, that was really the straw that broke the camel's back, literally. And it really could have uh, been the very end of this, of this friendship because, and it's ironic in a way, because Roosevelt goes off in 1910, as, as, as you mentioned, he goes off to, under the, on this fabulous uh, safari sponsored by the Smithsonian, underwritten by Andrew Carnegie. This may be the most Roosevelt thing ever. He's, he's <laughs> off there hunting elephants, hunting the white rhinoceros and, and, and going all around Africa, accepting his Nobel Prize for the Russo-Japanese War years earlier, going to Paris, going to these marvelous resorts in Italy. And Lodge is literally stalking him in terms of letters. <laughs> Everywhere Roosevelt goes, there's a letter from Henry Cabot Lodge. Taft is doing this. Taft is doing that. In Paris, you better get back here because things aren't going well. In London, well, the public wants you back. You need to come back. And Roosevelt initially had no interest in coming back. He had said, I've done my part. He was unhappy with the Republican Party as it as it was. He was resentful towards the Republican Congress who had done everything they could to extinguish his agenda during his second term in office. And he had no interest in coming back. And it was Lodge who, stroking his ego, whispering in his ear, which is something that that Lodge was very, very good at, Roosevelt comes back and eventually decides to run against William Howard Taft in this primary, along with uh, fighting Bob LaFollette of Wisconsin. And what happens is Roosevelt gives these series of speeches where he starts making these comments that really concerns Lodge. Things like how he's in favor of senatorial, of, of, of independent elections, of public uh, direct elections for the Senate, how he thinks that justices should be recalled by the citizenry if they're not doing a good job. Uh, believing that private property, if it's really necessary, should be taken over by the state. I mean, all these things. And Lodge, who believed in the Constitution as written, as written, he hated the idea of of direct election of uh, of senators. He hated the idea. He had to actually run several times in in elections where he actually, God forbid, had to go and campaign in front of the people for their votes. Um, but this was something that Lodge could not uh, forgive and he couldn't uh, let it go. And he wrote Roosevelt a letter when he said, you know what, he said, I, I have gone through a lot, but you have done something that has hurt me deeper than anybody has, has ever hurt me before. He said, I thought we were on the same page. I thought we knew one another. Clearly we do not. Our agendas are completely different and I will not support you in this primary. And Lodge believed that the friendship between the two was more important than politics. And he sat out the, uh, the 1912 election when Roosevelt ran on that third party ticket. He did, however, arrange for Taft to win the Massachusetts primary. And I have no idea if Roosevelt knew this or not. Edith Roosevelt, TR's wife, never forgave Henry Cabot Lodge for going against uh, her husband. She used to say that she would have nightmares about Lodge and the other, her other former good friend, Elihu Root, who uh, opposed TR's bid for a third term in 1912 as well. And the only thing that brings them together, back together, is when somebody tries to kill Theodore Roosevelt in 1912, when, Rose, when Lodge writes these heartfelt um, telegrams. And then there's the mutual hatred for Woodrow Wilson, which brings them back together. It's complaining about Wilson that really draws them back together. 
the enemy of my enemy is my friend. <laughs> but, I mean, that assassination story is one of those marvelous Theodore Roosevelt moments where the bullet is stopped by papers in his pocket. And as I was reading, I was dying to know, do we know what the papers in his pocket were? There was actually, I think it was his speech. <laughs> <laughs> and I think if you go to, I don't know where it is, maybe it's the Smithsonian, there is literally that speech with the bullet hole in it. That's marvelous. Some people have a Bible. TR had his own words. Yeah. And it was, it was so thick that, you know, the bullet hole could only go so far. The bullet could only go so far. <laughs> Um, we, it should be open to audience which questions. I think now yeah. would be, I think we could, I could listen for another hour, <laughs> no. but I know we are on a timeline. So would now be a good time to open it up to some questions? Yes, I have been monopolizing a lot of it. Do you want to talk about questions? the documents at all? Or do we want to talk about? Uh, did you want to talk about the documents? Yeah, one of the things I, I wanted to point out, mm -hmm. and because I did spend mm -hmm. a lot of my time on these letters, is that collection I was telling you about, the published collection, of the correspondence between Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge, and I'll speak quick about it, because it goes back to Lauren's point about myth and reality. Mm -hmm. Those letters in that published volume were changed by Henry Cabot Lodge. They senior. were senior. And it's ironic because Lodge was a historian, mm -hmm. one of the first historians with a PhD from Harvard, mm -hmm. but he was unhappy with several things that Roosevelt had said in the letters, not about him, but about other people. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to make Roosevelt, Roosevelt's reputation as stellar as possible, even though Roosevelt was proud of saying, I'm an open book. And Roosevelt had encouraged Lodge to publish these correspondence because of course he said something to the effect, or may have said something to the effect of, gee, Cabot, just think if you publish this correspondence, it would be the greatest book about me <laughs> ever. <laughs> And Lodge just thought about it and said, yeah, I'll publish the correspondence. But in, uh, in conversation with Roosevelt's widow, Edith, he said, you know what? These letters will never see the light of day. And uh, he changed them and he removed words. He removed paragraphs. He, he uh, just took out letters entirely, uh, all to make both he and Roosevelt uh, look better, perhaps, than, than they were. So... Though that collection, which you can find online, and certainly some of the letters in there are accurate, many of them are, but many of them are not. And so it's a dangerous source um, to use. And that's why I spent my time comparing the letters in the archives with these published ones. And it was a really interesting, but tedious experience. That's fascinating because you expect that with memoirs. You know memoirs lie. But when you're reading correspondence that purports to be actually contemporary, you assume that you're reading their actual thoughts and feelings at the time. Yeah, and I wasn't the first person. I mean, there have been a couple, a couple of other authors who, um, who, who pointed this out. But since my book, as I've said it before, really lays on the foundations of these letters, I felt it was something that I needed to devote some space to. And I write about that in the... Um, in the uh, when I discuss the sources at the end of the book. Have you ever thought of doing an unedited version of the letters? Somebody asked me that. It would take me such a long time. <laughs> and I don't want to go back. I want to go back. But first of all, Henry Cabot Lodge's handwriting is horrible. <laughs> it's illegible. You cannot, you cannot read it. And I was lucky that so many of the letters were typed between the two of them, or rather Lodge's secretary mm -hmm. typed them. But there also were some wonderful people in the soon to be Theodore Roosevelt Library, who translated these letters for me, and God love them, because mm -hmm. I don't know what it would, I, I'm not very good at reading handwriting. My own handwriting is horrible, I can barely read that. So you had Lodge. Yeah, exactly. So, so, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, you mentioned uh, when Roosevelt and Lodge met, what phase of uh, T.R.'s career was that? Was that when he was a state legislator? It or? was right after he left the state legislature. It was the, it was the year his wife and uh, mother both passed away. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the Lodge had written Roosevelt because both had been selected by their respective states to serve as the delegates to the 1884 convention. And Lodge, who always was interested in finding the new, uh, the, the new, uh, the popular new figure or somebody who has a really great political future on the Republican side, wrote TR and said, you know, congratulations. I'd really love to meet you. 
And Roosevelt said, why don't you come up to New York and we can go down to Washington together and see if we can find somebody uh, who can replace James Blaine on the Republican ticket. And that's how they got to know one another. They had known one another briefly at Harvard because Lodge was seven and a half years older, yeah. but they were both members of Porcellian. Lodge was actually literally a professor at Harvard teaching colonial history. He was not exactly what I would call a, a compelling uh, professor because his class, I believe, started with 16, quickly whittled down to about there were there were no there were no student evaluations. <laughs> um, but but that's I think it was those the, uh, the exchange of letters. Alice Lee Roosevelt's first wife was also his distant relative of, of Cabot Lodges, and I think they may have also met at one of the engagement affairs in in Boston. Okay, so yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, given that you said at the beginning that you really enjoy reading about friendships and seeing movies about friendships and that sort of thing, what about this correspondence did you enjoy the most and what did you dislike? Well, I don't think there was anything I, I disliked. I loved how open it was, how transparent it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really said what they thought, which is something we don't see today. Right. But also, uh, it bespeaks an incredible level of trust between the two of them. I mean, for Roosevelt to say what he thought was not unusual, but I imagine for Lodge to confide all this in Roosevelt said a great deal. Yes, and, and Lodge wrote more letters to Roosevelt than, uh, than TR did to Lodge. And sometimes Lodge wrote two to three letters a day to TR. And they confided to one another about their deepest thoughts and feelings when... Roosevelt's brother Elliot was going through uh, what would ultimately lead to the end of his life, you know, alcoholism, uh, alcoholic fits and other things and just bad behavior. Roosevelt would literally write to Lodge that I, I do not know what to do. I do not want to think of what is coming uh, in the future. And when uh, there are other things that happen, I'm not going to tell you because I don't want to spoil the book, there are a lot, there's a lot of tragedy in that book and a lot of tragedy uh, among these two men and friends and family. Um, so there's a lot of heartfelt correspondence there. But I, I, um, I, I enjoyed all of it. Certainly there were some tedious things where, where they were talking about a lot of patronage stuff. We should get what uh, Lodge was always concerned to make sure that he so-and-so was appointed to this position in the Boston Navy Yard. and. That, those were things that were left out of the published correspondence because Lodge didn't want to, you know, come across as well, just, you know, a regular politician mm -hmm. where people needed stuff and uh, he was going to do what he could to give it to them. Very interesting. Uh, do we have any more questions? Um, I, I have a good question. Um, I think it's fascinating with the letters and the correspondence. I feel like we don't as a society do that anymore. Um, how are these stories gonna to be told in the future? Yeah, it's gonna be difficult. And this is a question I, uh, which has been raised before because we have email, okay. but everyone is very, very cautious and and mm -hmm. it's it's gonna to be uh, tough. I mean, you can't keep a journal in government anymore because you're, you're subpoenaed, then forget it. <laughs> um, and you just hope that that people will write things down and and keep notes and and uh, keep some keep letters and, and and that kind of thing. And we'll just have to see as 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 we go in terms of, of presidents and documents and, and the other things. Well, of course, and you've got the dual problem of people writing less and writing more at the same time. That there's such a volume of emails and checks produced. That that a, a historian could drown in them. In a way, there wasn't when you were writing on paper and had to have greater economy of words. It's going to get worse. You're going to have to start interpreting chat GPT <laughs> correspondence. So oh dear. Right. Was that written by artificial intelligence or by a person? Yeah. Although I will say, for my brief um, period as a lawyer doing job review, people are not as cautious over email as they are advised to be. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, or, or text messaging even. Right, all of which can be reproduced. But I think, you know, from the historian's perspective, the sheer volume of all of that is really quite daunting. 
Yeah, no, there's no question. And mm -hmm. that's why in a way I I see these 700, 800 page <laughs> autobiographies and like, I, I just don't know if I could write one of those because it is daunting. And yeah, on the other hand, you managed to boil down such an incredible amount of material into a very readable account without really leaving any major parts of their lives out. Well, I, I also wrote this book because I, I think everybody should have the opportunity to read and enjoy history. And you shouldn't have to be someone with a PhD or an advanced degree to appreciate it. And so I think everybody who loves a good story, which is ultimately what history should be, mm -hmm. that's the reason I wrote the book, because I wanted uh, folks to read it, because I wanted people to enjoy it, because I wanted people to obviously learn something. But I, I love the idea of exciting characters and great drama. And Lauren knows this because you write about these folks all the time. Well, I think we take a very similar view of history, which is that it's very personality driven, that it's not broad social movements. Your social history was very in when I was in grad school, mm -hmm. but I was trained by a political historian who believed firmly that history is a series of accidents caused by personalities. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that comes out so clearly in this book. Um, and I had not realized before how much Teddy Roosevelt's ascension to the presidency relied on the accident of his friendship with Lodge and Lodge's personality acting upon Roosevelt. And that's exactly the sort of thing. It's that those little personal interactions that really shape history. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the reasons I, I titled the book um, A Friendship That Changed History, because it did, because both these men were so determined and so driven to achieve um, political success. And then once they got there, they had an agenda that they were determined to make sure that it came to fruition. You know, two people really have the ability to change the world. If you really want to and really put yourself through, the, through patience, timing, perseverance, all that, it, it can happen. And that's what I think happened here. So what is next for you after this? Another popular history, another more narrow scholarly project? No, no, no. Well, I, I'm, 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 I'm all about, I'm all about this. <laughs> here, here. Uh, I, I think I'm going to try to, and, and publishing, as you know, it's so fickle, you never know if you can, what's mm -hmm. going to happen. But I, I'm going to try to write a book about the formative years of Dwight Eisenhower, mm -hmm. because there is no single volume that goes from Eisenhower's childhood up through right before the eve of World War II, before he becomes the great general that we know him to be. David McCullough said that we don't have enough books on presidents as children. And I think that's important. And I, I think that's really what sort of has drawn me to this. And uh, we'll see how it all shakes out. So I don't know, but well, that's what I'd like to do. Yeah. It's always so so interesting to see where those gaps in the historiography are, where you think, okay, surely there must be a book about this, and then you go and look, and there's nothing there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, yes, I see if, it another... come, if it comes out, I hope to be back here talking. <laughs> well, I see another question. Uh, were there other friendships that you came across before you finally decided on Teddy and Cabot? No, <laughs> no, I, I really didn't, and I, I consulted with a a couple of, of and, and Edmund Morris actually says in, in his book that this really was one of the great friendships in, in American history. And I think it's really one of the great correspondence in American history too. In fact, I think it's longer than uh, Jefferson and, and Adams. There's more letters there. Um, but it, it was, that was really, it just, I was very lucky to find it. It's hard to come up with ideas one of the things I wanted to ask you is how do you come up with your ideas? Because you're so <laughs> <laughs> I mean, often it's a case of falling down a historic rap a historical rabbit hole. And sometimes you get lucky and you find that sort of source base where you realize, oh my goodness, there's all this material here. The book before this one, that was actually the proximate cause of this one too. I had found out, I stumbled upon a memoir by a member of the Smith College Relief Unit which was a group of Smithies who went to the front in World War I to bring humanitarian aid to villagers right behind the front lines, who I'd never heard of. I thought this had to be fiction. It sounded insane that there were Smithies seven miles 
from the front line. They are being shelled while building houses and teaching kindergarten classes to French children. And I, call, I, I went um, to the archivist at Smith College and I found out that they had the correspondence of all the original members of that Smith College relief unit. And like the Lodge and Roosevelt letters, they were the most frank and honest things ever. And they were supposed to be censored, most of them. But the women were writing things like, so I wandered into this office and there was this map on the wall with little dogs in it. So I think they're going to attack here soon. Or see, and, you know, and all you know, things from that to grand military strategy to, so this other woman in the unit, she's been entertaining officers late at night. And it's really annoying because I can't get to sleep. And so it was just everything. So, you know, this incredibly detailed narrative from multiple perspectives. And like I was saying about gaps in the historiography, I thought surely someone has to have in this and no one had. And there was just thousands and thousands of letters waiting for me to turn them into a book. And actually this book is about the founder of the Smith College Relief Unit in her equally crazy youth. When she went to go, she, she went to Athens because she wanted to be an archeologist was told by the um, head of the American School of Classical Studies in Athens that it was okay, she could study there. She could be a classics librarian, that was fine, but women don't dig. And in a fit of pique, she wound up nursing in the Greco-Turkish War and then wound up signing up with Clara Barden to nurse in the Spanish-American War. So it's, you know, one thing leads you to another and you follow the sources. Sorry, that was a very long answer. <laughs> how were you able to, to, to do your research during COVID? How, how, was, how difficult was that and, and how did you manage? I mean, I had, my problems were similar to yours. Mercifully with Band of Sisters, my Smith College Relief Unit book, the heroic librarians at Smith College had digitized thousands of pages of material for me because I had a one-year-old and I couldn't go spend months in the archives at Northampton. But I finished writing that book a month into lockdown and was going to start working on this one. And I emailed my librarian friends at Smith College saying, okay, finish that one. Now can I have um, the papers of Harriet Boyd Hawes because I'm writing a book based on her youth for my fictionalized version of her. And I got an email back saying the library is closed indefinitely. Oh. And so what I wound up doing was this became a very different book because I could not get my hands on her papers. And so I wound up creating a much more fictional character than I'd intended and using other sources because I could not get at that specific woman's correspondence. It was one of those moments I'm so grateful I write fiction because if I had been working on a project like yours, I could not have gone away with that. Well, yeah, it's, it's and, and all of TR's papers are actually digitized by the Library of Congress, but it's a very tedious process to work your way through this, this website. I mean, it, it's... I was actually, I just had drinks with a good friend from grad school who's an early Americanist, who's now become an archivist with the National Archives, and she was giving me the scoop. I mean, this is the sort of stuff historians gossip about after three martinis, about <laughs> the issues with their, with, them, their, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with their digitization systems. Um, and the various reasons why it's so hard to get the documents you need and to search them. Yeah. And I had never realized the sort of behind the scenes stuff that went into how these documents are cataloged, how they're stored, how whether you can search within them or not. You know, these are things we didn't have to deal with back when we were in grad school in the dark ages. But now in our new digitized world, they've become so important. It's very hard. And I was fortunate to have a really a wonderful research assistant mm -hmm. who found uh, a letter it was a, like a condolence letter i think from from tr at lodge about something but she literally kept calling the library comments drove these people absolutely crazy you know thank goodness for her because she couldn't find it on the on it, it was just very hard it, it took me every time i looked for a document mm -hmm. it took me something like 40 minutes to an hour to try to find it Oh, it's maddening. And what drives me particularly crazy, I'm sure you've encountered this too, is when you find documents that are quoted in the secondary sources, and often they will be quoted in paraphrase or in brief snippets again and again, and you try to find the original source, and it doesn't exist anymore. Or sometimes you wonder, did it ever exist? Did that original you know, 1920s historian make this up? Yeah, there was, there was a story <laughs> that I actually had uh -huh. in my draft about James Blaine, that Blaine, uh, for those of you, if you 
looked at, at James in play on your phones and saw a picture of him. He's a very distinguished, very distinguished looking man, with striking white beard. And there was a story in a in a somebody's dissertation, a paper or an essay or something, that there had been a, a crazed person on top of the Capitol Dome in Washington uh, during, I think, uh, Garfield's time and Blaine was Secretary of State then. And the guy decided to take a shot at James Blaine and he could see him coming a long distance away because of that white beard. And I spent my time, I think I spent a few hours trying to find news article about this mm -hmm. assassination attempt. And I couldn't find it. It just, I don't know. I don't know where this person got it, where they made it up. And you wonder, did this happen? Did it not yeah. happen? Because and I didn't use it because I had no <laughs> proof that it actually, and I, just because of some, you know, somebody's unpublished paper, um, you know. I know, and sometimes they're good. so tempting because the stories are so good, you <laughs> think. Yeah. <laughs> and again, this is where sometimes I'm glad I write fiction instead Story, of nonfiction, yeah, because rumors. then you can use that sort of thing and then put in the historical note, this story is not, you know, effectively <laughs> documented, however. Yeah, I used a collection of stories of anecdotes mm -hmm. by, I think it was Henry Cabot Lodge's junior's uh, granddaughter. Um, I've forgotten what her name was. It was called The Lodge Women. Mm -hmm. And it was a very nice book, you know, there were, but there were no footnotes. Was very, it was very hard and she used them, but it wasn't sort of a professional book. But I found out that the uh, sister-in-law of, of Henry Cabot Lodge's son, Bay Lodge, who married a very, very beautiful woman, a woman named Matilda Frillingham, who's, her name was Bessie and became Bessie Lodge. Her mother, who was a great social doyenne, was the mistress for Chester A. Arthur for a very long time. And her husband, Bessie's father, received a position as an undersecretary of state in uh, Chester Arthur's uh, president on, in, in, uh, in his administration. And when that happened, people weren't particularly surprised <laughs> that he got that opportunity because they sort of knew what was going on. That's so French. <laughs> all right well i think we're gonna have to call it there because i think we might want some books signed and and um but can i just thank you both for being yes. here you were absolutely what a wonderful conversation thank you um thank you all for coming and thank you for your wonderful questions yeah